The Grand Dahl Concerto is probably my favorite standard concerto for the trombone. It has beautiful melodies, tons of contrast, and tons of opportunities for storytelling and drama. There are also some chances for you to put your own personal stamp on the piece. For me, this whole piece is about contrast and the ebb and flow of energy and momentum. When I'm preparing or coaching this piece, I'm always asking myself, am I on my way somewhere or am I on my way back from somewhere? Am I creating energy at this moment or am I absorbing energy at this moment? The tricky part, especially in the first movement, is that there are so many arrival points and many of them happen very quickly. The pacing is very fast. And sometimes between just a few measures of music, you have multiple big arrival points. Remember that not all arrival points have to have the same significance or importance. Hopefully you will hear in my performance video of this piece that I have certain places that I think are of primary importance and then other arrival points that are of secondary importance. Another way to think about it maybe is in terms of language or literature. If I'm telling a story and maybe each movement is a different chapter, where are the exclamation points? Where are the commas? Where are the punctuations? Where are the paragraph breaks? Sometimes thinking of the story in that way can help you prioritize what are the really important places to go to. Each movement has two primary themes in it. The first and third movement have an A, B, A, B, A form, and the second movement is simply A, B, A, B. Now, as the composer brings you back to these themes repetitively, you have a decision to make. Are you going to make this similar to the first time you played it? Are you going to make it different? And if so, how? Really thinking about how each of those themes develops as it keeps coming back is one of your big jobs as the performer. I've had many students who conceptualize of this piece almost as a narrative. They might even come up with a story in their minds. And that's a great way to maybe conceptualize the piece. The main thing is to have a plan. If you have a character, what is that character doing? Or are there multiple characters or is it different sides of the same character? Whichever way you choose to conceptualize the piece, have a plan, have some concrete thoughts about what is happening here in that part of the story. Another way to think about it is, as somebody listens to me perform the Grandal Concerto, what do I hope that they are feeling or maybe imagining as they listen to me play this? A couple of practical things for the whole piece before I get into some advice for each individual movement. You'll notice that in the printed parts, all three movements have a printed metronome marking of 80 beats per minute. I find it extraordinarily unlikely that the composer actually wanted the entire piece to go at 80 beats per minute, but it's at least theoretically possible. So my advice is to at least try each movement at 80 and then adjust from there. But making sure that if you choose to go faster or slower for artistic reasons, that it's done thoughtfully and intentionally. specific pieces of advice about the first movement, starting with the opening four note motif. I hear a lot of people that emphasize the very first note of the motif because it's the highest and because it's the first note. But remember that in this era of music especially, downbeats and long notes were of primary importance. So in that four note motif, it's the final note that is not only the tonic of the key that we're in, it's also the downbeat and it's the longest note. So it goes from the first note with direction to the fourth note. D yum dum da is where you're aiming every time that theme comes back. Mm -hmm. 
Second, I strongly believe that this piece is heavily influenced by the late romantic operas, especially of composers like Puccini. I now actually have all of my students that are preparing this piece go listen to works like Tosca or Madame Butterfly because I think there's so much in common with that style of writing. One place that that shows up in a very powerful way are in several cadenza-like sections where the accompaniment drops out completely and you're on your own for several measures with these almost recitative-like passages. My advice is to take that freedom and run with it. Don't be afraid to experiment and kind of see what you can get away with that still makes musical sense. In the second movement, at rehearsals seven and 10, we have these wonderful lullaby-like sections. My advice for those sections is to make sure that you really subdivide at the 16th note level, because I hear a lot of young players that sort of approximate that rhythm. Now, I don't mean that it's meant to be robotic and metronomic, but the 16th rhythms should still be recognizable as 16th note rhythms. The other thing is that between measures 38 and 48, as we approach the big climax of this movement, is probably the most challenging part of the piece in terms of wear and tear on the chops and in terms of musical momentum. I think the solution for both problems can be the same solution, which is to let the tempo move forward a little bit. You'll hear in my performance video that I move forward in measure 39 and then again in measures 42 and 43 which I believe helps the musical momentum move forward and not stagnate. And it also helps the endurance issues so that you don't have problems in the subsequent movement. is extremely operatic in nature and I'll once again say that if you really understand the recitative and aria style it will really help you in shaping and phrasing that opening. One of the coolest things about the finale in the rondo section is the rhythmic complexity that the composer uses. This can definitely be a challenge for young players, and of course, really great subdivision is needed here. My advice is to take out the ties as you're preparing the piece initially. I think many of the rhythms are made more difficult because the composer ties over strong beats and downbeats. By taking the ties out and really learning how the subdivisions of the rhythm work, then it's not too difficult to put the ties back in as you progress through the piece. One final note is that I realize that there is a tradition in many circles to take certain sections of the first and third movements up an octave. I've chosen in my performance video to leave those where they're written on the page, partially because it's in the spirit of this standard repertoire project. I want all of these pieces to be unintimidating and accessible, especially by young players. That said, if you have the high chops, more power to you. I hope some of this has been helpful and I'm so excited for you to dig into all three movements of the Grandal Concerto. Thanks for watching and listening.